Good morning, everybody. It is great to be with you today. I hope that you're all doing well. Uh, Throughout this year, the year of 2024, we are attempting to focus more upon fellowship. And fellowship is joining in God's redemptive plan. And one of the ways that we're doing that is each week we're reading, or each month, we're focusing on reading a passage that has to do with fellowship. And this month it is Psalm 133. Let's read that text together. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion, For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. This morning I'd like to begin with a question. Why do we test things? Uh, Engineers test cars. In fact, I have some friends that uh, every year they come and spend time in Death Valley driving cars around, doing their best to get those cars to fail as they test them to uh, to see if everything's right. Engineers test buildings, check to see if it can handle the load, check and see if it can withstand the elements and the weather. We test children, uh, give them tests in school to see uh, if their understanding holds up to a little level of scrutiny. Uh, For the purpose of a test is to ask the question, uh, does it hold up? Does it hold up to stress? Does it hold up uh, to probing? Uh, Does it hold up? And here in 1 John, and today we'll be in 1 John chapter 4, in the opening verses of 1 John, John encourages us to test, to test our beliefs. Let's read that text together. 1 John chapter 4, uh, but before you uh, turn there, how many Bibles do we have? How many Bibles are there? What a fantastic sight. What a magnificent opportunity to come together to read the Word of God together. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of the truth and the spirit of error. Uh, The theme of John is born of God. And over and over again, John talks or encourages, reiterates what he's already told these early Christians he was writing to, of what it means to be born of God, what, what it means to abide in God, what it means to be part of God. And he expresses that to abide in God, to be born of God, is to pursue righteousness and to love our brothers as Christ has loved us. It appears that there were some who had risen up who began to teach these early Christians something other than what John had said. And so one of his purposes is John tries to combat that which was falsely preached by reiterating what he'd already told them. In fact, over and over again, John says, I've already told you this. I've already told this. Remember what you heard from the beginning. I've already told you this. And he implores them to test. In fact, specifically in verse 3, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. The story is told of two men who were out walking their dogs. And as they walked, they decided that it was time to go get lunch. And the problem was, is they really weren't entirely addressed for the attire or for the day and for the occasion. And they both had dogs. And they were concerned that the restaurant would not permit them to enter. And so one of them concocted the plan that they would pretend that their dogs were guide dogs. That they were blind, that they themselves were blind, and that these were their guide dogs, and that rather than going both at the same time, for that would seem a little weird, 
Instead, they would go one at a time. So the first man went up, and he greeted the hostess there, who the hostess said, I'm sorry you can't bring your dog in, to which he responded that, well, he's my seeing eye dog. And so she looked at the German shepherd and said, okay, well, great, I, I didn't realize that, so come, come sit down. And so she did. About five minutes later, his friend came along, came up and said, I too have a seeing eye dog. To which she looked at the dog and said, really? They gave you a chihuahua? To which he responded, is that what they gave me? Why do we tell lies? Why do people lie? They lie usually either to get something or to avoid something. If you think about when you were a kid, you either lied to try and get out of trouble or because you wanted something from your parents. Satan is described as the father of lies. For he too wants something. His desire is to fool as many people in the world as he possibly can with his lies so as to cause God pain and rob him of those who he wants to live with him. And here in 1 John we encounter four lies that are directly against Christ. For, for that is what the term antichrist means. Anti or, or against or opposed Christ. That which is against And here in 1 John, we encounter four lies that are directly against Christ. The first one we find in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. That he who denies that Jesus is the Son of God denies his deity. We're told that Christ came in the flesh, that he was fully, completely, 100% God, that God came down to man. And anyone who denies that Jesus was fully God, that it is something that is directly against Christ. We encounter the second one in 1 John chapter 3. In verse 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now notice that word practiced. John is not talking about those of us who are Christians who we strive as we might, we try as we might, and yet we sin. In fact, John begins his letter by saying, if anyone says he does not sin, he's a liar. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, his blood continually cleanses us, and we have fellowship with God and one another. That as Christians, we're, we're supposed to strive to pursue righteousness. And we're supposed to try and walk in the light to do what God would want us to do. And sometimes that means we're on our face. Sometimes that means we're crawling, but we're trying to walk in the light. Here what John is talking about is those who practice unrighteousness. Those who would teach that it's okay to follow Christ and yet live in sin at the same time. That it's okay to follow Christ and not be striving to pursue righteousness. That as Christians, we are to pursue righteousness and be holy because our God is holy. The third one we find here in 1 John chapter 4, actually we find number 3 and 4 here in 1 John chapter 4. Beginning in verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come, has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Anyone who denies, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Uh, to deny the humanity of Christ. For Jesus was both fully God and fully man at the same time. It's anyone who would deny the virgin birth that Christ came miraculously and was born of a virgin, was born of a woman and was fully man, but also fully God at the same time. 
How did that happen? I have absolutely no idea. I'll ask God when I get there. But we also encounter the fourth one in the same passage. But we're told in John's gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. That Christ is the fulfillment of what we find within the pages of the Bible, which means we have to believe that the Bible is inspired, for otherwise we know nothing. And nothing is true. So we must believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. So to believe that which is against Christ is the belief that Christ came either not as God or not as man. That it's okay to both follow Christ and practice unrighteousness. And that the Bible is the uninspired page of words on a page. Now just because that someone believes these things does not mean that they are the devil incarnate. But it does mean that they're believing something that is directly from the pit of hell. And notice what John says. He says to test. To test and see what is true. We've talked before about how Aurora's favorite snack is flaming Hot Cheetos. I am white. They are too hot. But Aurora loves flaming Hot Cheetos. It's her favorite snack, and so whenever I go to the grocery store, what am I going to get her? What do I do if there's nothing there? I grab my phone as fast as I can. What do you want instead? Why do I do that? Well, one, I don't want to get in trouble. But predominantly... Because I love her. And I care about her. I care about what she says and care about what she wants and what she thinks. And so I try and do what she's asked us me to do. Our God is the one who loves us the most. Who sent his son to die that we might live with him. And if he asks us to do something, we should want to do what he's asked us to do. And our task as Christians is to test and see If what we believe is true, because we want to please the one who loves us so much. And if we are to test our beliefs, it begins by continually being engaged with the word of God. For it is here that we learn what is true. I suspect that many of you are aware of the FBI training technique for discovering counterfeit currency. Rather than looking at every single possible counterfeit, they instead spend all of their time memorizing the one true currency. And by doing so, they're able to recognize all which is counterfeit. But how are we to recognize what is false if we don't know what is true? And if we know what is true, then we will therefore recognize what is false. That as Christians, we are to be in the word so that we will grow and so that we are able to recognize what is true and what is not. If we are to test our beliefs, the first thing that we have to do is to test our thoughts and feelings. By show of hands, how many of you in your Christian walk believe something now that you didn't at one point? Oh, good, I'm glad you're all growing. It's what it means to grow. That at some point our beliefs change and we either learn something we didn't know before or perhaps our perception of something changes a little bit or perhaps we realize, man, I was wrong. But it means that we're not infallible and that we need to test that which we believe. Which leads to the question, well, how in the world do we do that? I'm glad you asked. Turns out I do use PowerPoint every once in a while. Who knew? First thing we should do is pray. That when we sit down to read the word, we should pray, Lord, help me to see what you want me to see. Help Help me to know what you want me to know. And help me apply it to my life. Second thing we should do is to search the scriptures and meditate upon them. The Apostle Peter once said of Paul that Paul teaches some things that are hard. 
some things that aren't easily grasped. Now, if the Apostle Peter said that about what Paul was teaching, I suspect it's okay if it's hard for us to grasp too. But if it's hard to grasp, what does that mean? It means that we have to sit and ruminate on it for a while. Have to let it digest that it may not be something that we can learn from just a tertiary scanning of what the text says, but there may be times, in fact, with all of Scripture, we should meditate on it to, to ingest and allow it to marinate within us. And we should seek godly counsel. One of the benefits of coming together as the family of God is that we have the opportunity to share different thoughts and ideas and understanding of Scripture. For as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, that as we engage in discussion of who God is, of what his text is, that perhaps someone else views it in a way that helps us to grow or challenges our understanding and allows us to grow through the process. Next thing we have to test, if we are to test our beliefs, is that we have to test what we are being taught. We have to test what we're taught, test what we are taught, even here. The reason being is because we are all fallible. Now I believe that everyone who teaches here, I believe that everyone who strives to present anything from Scripture legitimately is trying to convey the truth. We are all fallible. And so you shouldn't take our word for it. You shouldn't take my word for it, for I too am fallible, but rather that we should follow the example of the Bereans who continually searched the scriptures to see if what was being taught was true. But how do we do that? Well, first of all, uh, Brother Parks has been teaching a fantastic class about how to uh, work through the Bible and study the Bible. And so if for some reason you've missed a portion of that, I'm sure we can make sure to get you the handouts if you so desire them, uh, even if you want them in digital format. That would be helpful. For one, we should consider the context. I'm going to give you just two ways that we can try and examine. And the first is to consider the context. For example, in Matthew chapter 7, we encounter perhaps one of the most abused texts in all of Scripture. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. And the way that text is usually understood by a large percentage of the populace is that means you should never tell anyone that what they're doing is wrong. However, there's a problem. If we read just a little bit further, we encounter two different things. One, remove the plank out of your own eye before removing the speck out of your other's. Jesus says that it's okay to communicate that there's a problem, just I'm supposed to be looking at myself first instead of looking at what else is wrong with everyone else. And the other is that in Matthew 7, 6, Jesus says, do not throw your pearls before swine or give what is sacred to dogs. Basically what he's saying is that there's a time to recognize that somebody doesn't want to listen. And you shouldn't keep talking. Why? Because if you do, they're going to get mad at you. But that would mean that we're supposed to make a judgment call as to whether they're wanting to listen or not. So therefore, it can't mean that do not judge means never, ever, ever saying anything or never making any kind of judgment. Rather, that, it's, we're not, that we are not to take the place of the judge and try and say, you're going to hell and you're not. And that we're supposed to look at ourselves first. Second one is to consider the whole counsel of Scripture. Did you know that you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to? I can. If we take certain sections of Scripture and limit it only to that, we can make the Bible say anything we want it to. If, however, we look at the entire counsel of Scripture, then we can get an idea of what God was trying to say. For example, do not judge, lest you be judged. Later, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says that we as Christians are to judge one another. That we're not supposed to be so concerned about what's going on in the world, but we are to hold each other to a standard. Because we all claim to be disciples of Christ and children of righteousness. We have to test our own beliefs and we have to test that which we are being taught. Even that which we are being taught by the most well-intentioned individuals in the world. Not as try of, oh, I got you. But rather because we want to please our God. We want to help each other grow. 
The last thing we have to do is to test what we're about to teach. And to do that, we have to ask a question. Is it an opinion or is it the word of God? Turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, and I want us to look at verse 3. Uh, the serpent, that is Satan, has come to Eve and is attempting to tempt her to take a bite of the fruit. Actually, we'll start, in, we'll start at verse 1. Now the, spirit was more, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of, the, eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Remember that. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16. Actually, we'll start in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you, shall, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat it. From the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Did God say anything about touching the fruit? It sounds as though Eve, in an attempt to obey God, added something. Was there anything wrong with that? Of course not, because you can't eat the fruit if you haven't first taken it. But notice that she attributed, you shall not touch it, to what God said. No wonder when she reaches out and grabs the fruit, in my mind's eye, I see her going, wait a minute, I didn't die. Huh, maybe that means I can eat it. There's nothing wrong with Eve saying, I don't even want to touch the fruit because God told me not to, not to eat of it. There's nothing wrong with that. The challenge was when it appears that she attributed it to what God said. And the truth is that we can fall into the same trap. But there's nothing wrong with, you, with making opinions about how we can do what God wants us to do. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when we then attribute our opinions to what God said. There's nothing wrong with saying, I see in Scripture that God says this, and I believe that that means, or my opinion is, that we should avoid it even to this extent. There's nothing wrong with saying that, provided that we differentiate between our opinion and what God actually said. For not only should we test what we believe, not only should we test what we hear, but we should also test what we're about to tell others. And as we test, it is essential that we test with thanksgiving for God's grace. All of you raised your hands earlier whenever I asked have you ever changed your opinion or your belief about what Scripture says? Have you ever learned anything? God is able to forgive our sins, able to forgive our transgressions. For if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ continually cleanses us. He forgives our moral, ethical failures and our failures, failures of righteousness. Now, he wants us to pursue righteousness, but it forgives us when we fail. Unless we can fully understand the mind of God in every way that he completely intended it, it means that there's somewhere in Scripture where we're wrong. Which means that God must also be able to forgive our theological failures. Now, again, we're supposed to be striving to do what God wants us to do, striving to understand what he wants us to to do and to understand his word but there's no way unless we can fully understand the mind of God that we will understand every single thing as it was completely intended which means that God has to forgive our theological failures or everything we're doing is for no purpose at all and not only do we need to thank God for his grace and his mercy 
we need to extend it to others. Insist upon the pursuit of righteousness and insist upon the pursuit of the knowledge of the truth, but do it with thanksgiving that we serve a merciful God. I'm reminded of burpees. I hate burpees. If you don't know what a burpee is, thank thank your lucky stars. It's part of practice, and we did a lot of them for basketball practice, over and over and over and over again until we were exhausted and tired and worn out, and Coach insisted on pushing us as hard as he could. He was testing us. And as he tested us, as he insisted on perfection, as we tested ourselves over and over and over again through every play, every burpee, every practice, we grew. And as we grew, we got closer to our goal. As we test our beliefs, as we test what we're being taught, as we test what we're about to teach, we are able to grow, and as we grow, we get closer to that goal, closer to finally hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant. Perhaps you're here today, and you want to begin a relationship with the one who loves you most, the one who sacrificed his son and sent him for you. And there's nothing that, we would, that would excite us more than to help you begin that journey which starts at baptism. Or perhaps you're here today and you haven't been living as you should and you want to make a change. If there's any way we can assist you, won't you come as together we stand and sing. There's a